Welcome back. It was a crime which pushed everything else off the front pages. Three men, all known criminals, found shot dead in the Essex countryside. It was a cold-blooded professional killing. The victims had many enemies, but which one wanted them executed? <laughs> And welcome back to a new video on the Essex Boys case. As always, if you are enjoying the content, please do give the video a thumbs up. And if you're interested in the Essex Boys case or simply true crime in general, don't forget to hit the subscribe button below. When the plumed horses rumbled to a halt, pulling the elaborate coffin behind them, the vicar was waiting on the Pitsy Church steps. The Reverend Laurie Blaney was there that winter morning to carry out the funeral service of gangland villain and cocaine addict Craig Rolfe. He admitted afterwards, quote, There were some real mafioso types there. Some of them even had camel hair coats. It did make me feel very careful what I said during the service. I had to strike a balance between a tribute to the dead man and remembering what he was said to have done. But the family seemed happy afterwards. The service was at St Gabriel's Church and a cortege of 20 cars followed the horse-drawn glass carriage carrying the coffin from his mother's house in Beanbridge. The Reverend Blaney relayed sentiments from Rolf's girlfriend and Rolf's mother Lorraine McCrow. The floral tributes were large and plentiful. One spelt out, My Son Craig, in white flowers. Another was designed like a book and read, You are not gone until you are forgotten and we will never forget you. The simple message was followed by four kisses. His seven-year-old daughter had sent one shaped like an angel. The next day was the turn of Tate and Tucker. The pair, who had been inseparable in life, were buried apart. Tate in Pitsy Cemetery next to Rolf and Tucker Upminster. A flower-decked, horse-drawn carriage led the way for Tate's funeral and police directed traffic as a bell tolled for the 25-minute service, which a brother gave a touching tribute. One floral tribute said simply, Daddy. A Cardus Hatch said, Thanks for the good times, I will never forget you, your baby son. Around 60 mourners sang all things bright and beautiful and recited the 23rd Psalm, The Lord is my shepherd. Tucker's burial took place with no less ceremony. This time, a limousine ferried the body to a service which more than 100 people attended. Many were doormen who had worked for him. Now Tate's and Rolf's headstones nestle side by side in the peace and serenity of Pitsy Cemetery. Tate's has all the ostentation of his funeral service and carries a photograph. It reads, Treasured memories of Pat Terence Tate who departed this life on December the 6th, 1995, aged 37. Loving father, loyal friend and brother. Missing your smiles and generous heart. Your presence will never leave us. Now you walk with the angels looking down from God's great kingdom. Until we meet again, God bless, we will never forget you. On its base, two white doves comfort each other and the back of the memorial reads, God found the path was growing rough, the hill too steep to climb, so he closed your eyelids and whispered peace be thine. Rolf's is more subdued and reads simply, In loving memory of a dear son, brother and father, Craig Anthony Rolf, who was taken from us December the 6th, 1995, aged 26. His life a beautiful memory, his absence a silent grief. Tucker's has a pair of boxing gloves, a tribute to his association with Nigel Benn engraved in gold. There is also a photo of the drug baron laughing. A poem from his girlfriend Anna Whitehead reads, So many things I want to say. I miss you in so many ways. I long to have you hold me tight through the empty days and lonely nights. In my dreams I see your face, so special you can't be replaced. I'll treasure all my memories of everything you were to me, and one sweet day we'll meet again. Till then my life is filled with pain, you are truly one of a kind to know and love. I was blessed, you are in my heart always, the best. On a separate outcrop is a message from his mum. 
Another remembers the sad death of his father Ronald, who died of a heart attack when he heard the news of his son's murder. The following newspaper article is from the 21st of the 1st, 1998, with the headline, Drug Deals That Led to Death. Something as insignificant as a batch of dodgy cannabis was to spell death for Pat Tate, Tony Tucker and Craig Rolfe. At the beginning of November 1995, Tate gave £70,000 to his old pal Michael Steele, who had regularly been ferrying cannabis across the North Sea, aided by Jack Wombs and Peter Corey. Darren Nichols, who was the star prosecution witness in the court case, revealed he and Corey would buy the drugs from John Stone, who ran Stone's Caf in Amsterdam, Holland. Then the pair would travel to Blankenberg in Belgium, and in scenes straight out of a spy novel, using torches and walkie-talkies, they would signal to steal in his inflatable boat. During that last drug importation worth £120,000, the tension behind Tate and Steele began to mount, and the trip was dogged by disaster. Steele discovered Tate's £70,000 was around £200 short, staff at Eurocar in Amsterdam refused to take cash for a vehicle Nichols had hired, and his credit card was over its limit. Nichols and Corey nearly missed Steele on the beach after going the wrong way. Corey accompanied Steele in a boat, but Nichols missed the last ferry home. Steele landed the drugs at Point Clear near Clacton, but was later arrested with Wombs by customs officers who spotted the boat. The officers searched Steele and discovered an electronic organiser. On it was logged the telephone numbers of Wombs, Tucker, Tate, Stone's Calf and Peter Corey, but no charges were brought. The situation deteriorated further when the drugs turned out to be dud. Tate was fuming. Andrew Monday QC prosecuting said, There was pride at stake. Steele had lost face. He was the importer but now had to admit that what he'd imported was rubbish. Tate was furious. Steele and Nichols travelled back to Amsterdam for a refund and after much haggling were given the sum back in full. They hoped to catch a train to Ostend where they planned to meet Tate and give him back his share but were followed to the station, probably by Stone's men. After dodging their pursuers, they hailed a taxi to Ostend at a cost of £400, leaving Steele badly out of pocket. The date was now November the 16th, 1995, and Tate was waiting in Ostend with pals including Craig Rolfe and Barry Dorman, the owner of Eastern Garages in Fobbing. Mr Dorman had given Tate £10,000 for the deal, believing he was going to buy a car. Tate got his cash back and returned to Basildon. But greed prompted him to tell those who had loaned him the £70,000 that Steele hadn't paid up. To bolster his story, Tate threatened to make Steele admit it on his knees, then he, Tate, would shoot him dead. Steele was further enraged to learn that one third of the dud cannabis had been saleable. His investigations showed Tate had received that third and probably sold it. Another point of tension between the former friends was Steele's fondness for Tate's ex-girlfriend Sarah Saunders. Mr Monday said, quote, It appears Tate wasn't behaving very well towards her. Steele and his partner Jackie Street, no doubt out of loyalty, were seeking to assist her. Steele decided the only way to deal with Tate was to kill him. If you would like to learn more about the Range Rover murders, then click on the video in front of you now. You will also see the Essex Boys playlist, which has all of the videos concerning this case in one convenient folder. Many thanks for joining me for this video. I look forward to seeing you all again for the next one. Take care. Cheers.